Hey, Algebra 2 Honor students, this is going to be the start of our next unit. Unit 4 is in the same packet as Unit 3, and you can find this worksheet that you're seeing on your, on your screen right now on page 24 in the packet. And this is just a, something that I put together for you guys to recall what you should already know about lines. In fact, you can even see that I want you to attest to the fact that my name is blank, and this is what I already know about lines. So these are things that you should know from Algebra 1, from geometry last year as far as slope, the equation of lines or concerns. Here's a quick fact about parallel lines. And I've given you some filled in examples of how to write the equation of a line given a point and a slope here. Um, we can do that in slope intercept form as well. If I gave you two points, we should be able to write the line that contains those two points. And I'm going to expect that when we recap this lesson, that you have read through this and that you understand these materials or that you'll ask about them before we go through our recap. So here's just some quick examples of graphing lines and finding a solution to a system of equations graphically. So we're just simply calculating the point of intersection there. And then there are two ways algebraically in which we solve systems. And we've got elimination and substitution outlined down below for you. No matter which method you choose, notice how we get to the same solution in the end. So I'd like you to take a few minutes, hit pause in the video if you need to right now, Read through page 24, make sure you feel pretty solid about that information or circle things that you'd like to ask me about next time we're together in class. So for now, we're gonna get into some notes by hand. So if you take out some paper, our first day of unit four is all about average rate of change, which we will abbreviate as AROC. Okay, so we're gonna talk about what average rate of change is and how we can calculate it and Overall, I think this will wind up being a quick lesson for us to get started in this unit. So the definition of average rate of change is it is the measure of how fast a function changes over a certain interval. So it has something to do with the steepness of the function over a certain period of time. So in simpler terms, what is it really? It's just slope. And since we hopefully are experts now from page 24 in the packet, we know that we can calculate slope if we were given two points whose coordinates are x1, y1, and then x2, y2. We know that the average rate of change, which is the slope, can be expressed in a few ways. I want you to be familiar with the notation delta y over delta x, delta representing the change in y over the change in x. And from there, we can then extend that out to saying it's the difference in the y values, y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And again, this is something you probably learned in middle school, and then it gets extended through algebra. And of course, you used to do probably a lot in geometry last year. Okay, so this is gonna look a little different, but the average rate of change for a given function over a defined interval from A to B, it's still gonna be a calculation of slope but we're gonna get just a little bit more some function notation here. When you take a look at what the graph of f of x looks like. So in your notes, I'd like you to draw a sketch of a graph that looks something like mine. Of course, it doesn't have to be identical, but if you have some sort of curve drawn in here, I want you to identify two places on your curve along the x-axis called the left end point A, the right end point B. So if we wanted to calculate the average rate of change from A to B over that closed interval, well, well, we would need to define what the Y values are on those functions. So A would correspond with some Y value F of A, if this is the function F of X, B would correspond with some Y value F of B, and therefore the average rate of change would be f of b minus f of a, the difference in the y values, divided by the difference in those x values. And although this is really, again, just the same thing as calculating slope, given different functions that we'll look at that maybe are not always talking about connecting points that are linear, we'll see this notation come up a fair bit and it will make sense that I can calculate the slope, the average rate of change over the interval from a to b, by connecting those points and doing the following calculation. So our first example that we're gonna look at in terms of calculating an average rate of change is which function has a greater average rate of change, AROC, from negative two to three. 
And I'll give us some functions to consider here. I'm giving us f of x equals 5x plus 7. And then g of x equals 2x squared plus 1. Okay, so to figure out which one has the greatest average rate of change, we have to figure out, in this case, from negative 2 to 3, that's the difference. Those are like your A and B values currently, right? So we have to figure out what is F of B and what's F of A. So if I call this one A and I call this one B, let's, for the function F of X, calculate F of 3. And then we'll do F of negative 2. So F of 3 in this case is going to be 5 times 3 plus 7. So 15 plus 7 is 22. And then f of negative 2 would be 5 times negative 2 plus 7. And negative 10 plus 7 is going to be a total of negative 3. So therefore, for the function f of x, the average rate of change would be f of b minus f of a. So it's the difference in those y values. Oops, sorry guys, just trying to adjust my camera here. That might be a little bit better. All right, so it's the difference in those y values, 22 minus negative three. I'm just gonna write that as 22 plus three when I go to plug into the formula here over the difference in the x values, three minus negative two, which I guess would be the same thing as three plus two. So we get 25 over five for an average rate of change of five. Okay, going over to the other side then for g of x, we're going to do just the same thing. Calculate the average rate of change given that we have the endpoints at negative 2 and 3. So let's calculate g of 3. That would be 2 times 3 squared plus 1. Make sure you just follow PEMDAS here. 3 squared is 9 times 2 is 18 plus 1 is 19. And then g of negative 2 would be 2 times negative 2 squared plus 1. And four times two is eight plus one is nine, All right? Negative two squared is positive four. So the average rate of change here would be 19 minus nine, right? Difference in those Y values over the difference in the X values. And three minus negative two again is just three plus two. So in this case, we get 10 over five for an average rate of change of two. So clearly once I calculate those two, then we can easily make the conclusion in the end that the function that has the greatest average rate of change over the interval from negative 2 to 3, which this can change, by the way, if we adjust the interval, we're going to say that f of x has the greater average rate of change from negative 2 to 3. Now, knowing what we know about these functions, this is linear and this is quadratic, right? So it would have that parabola shape. I bet if we adjust this interval, and let's say I went to look at the average rate of change from 10 to 15 or something like that. If average rate of change represents something in terms of steepness, parabolas grow a lot faster and steeper after a certain point than a linear function would. So I bet at a certain point, you know, the function g of x, its average rate of change over a defined interval would be more than f of x. But for this specific interval, we see that kind of f of x wins out. And by the way, one quick point here is, was anyone surprised that this five matched this up here for the linear function? Probably not. I mean, if we're thinking about average rate of change, although it's nice to be able to do the calculation to confirm that yes, our answer is five, we shouldn't be too surprised to see that the average rate of change is just the same as the slope of the line. It has to be, right? Lines have constant slopes. So that's actually the, the next note that I really just want you to make a quick note about in your notes is that linear functions always have a constant average rate of change, which happens to be the slope of the line. Let me just adjust this here for you guys quick. That looks better. Okay. So if we're dealing with a, an average rate of change question and it happens to be a linear function and we recognize that, in theory, you don't really necessarily have to cal calculate the average rate of change. It doesn't matter what that interval is. Over that interval, it has to equal whatever the slope of the line is. Okay. And we're actually going to use that information to be able to do example two. Example two says, well, the table for f of x below shows a linear function. 
And we're going to use this information to find the values of A, B, and C. So you can see where A, B, and C are located in your table here. Take a second to copy that into your notes. We have A over here, it's a Y value. B is a value of X. And then C is a value of Y. So because all linear functions have constant slopes, that's really the only way we can do this question. Because we, at the very beginning of the table, we're given at least two coordinate points that we can work with. So if we calculate the average rate of change between from one to five for this function, we would find that the average rate of change or the slope would equal the difference in the y values. Okay, so make sure you subtract the y values for f of x, which would be one minus the negative five over the difference in the x values, five minus one. And that's gonna be six fourths, which is nicely reduced to three halves. And once you calculate that, I hope that you're thinking that all we need to do then to figure out the values for A, B, and C is calculate the slope between two adjoining points and set that equal to what we know the average rate of change is, that constant average rate of change for this linear function, which is three halves. Now, when you pick any two points, I just want you to be careful that if I choose, if I wanna find A first, which seems logical, that I choose to find the slope between 11 comma a, which is what this point technically is, and then another defined point that doesn't have one of these other variables in it, okay? Because we don't wanna have to create, I guess, what a system of equations might result in. All right, so let's take these two points actually right next to each other here. From five to 11, that average rate of change to find a. Let's do the difference in the y's, so that would be a minus one. And then do the difference in the x's, 11 minus five, and set that equal to the average rate of change, which we saw was three halves. Okay, so really quickly there, we can simplify to get <clears throat> a minus one is gonna get multiplied by two if we cross multiply. On the other side, you're gonna get three times 11 minus five, which is six. Make sure we distribute the two. Two a minus two is equal to 18. Add the two over. If two a equals 20, then a must be 10. Okay, it's a very similar process for some of these other questions. And now that you know a is 10, you can feel free to use that. Like if I wanted to just kind of write that in right there, that a is 10, you can find the average rate of change now between these two connecting points. But even if you found the average rate of change between five one and, and b 22, then certainly we should still get the same result. It shouldn't matter there, okay? But knowing that A is 10, maybe I'll just kind of use these two connecting points right there, so to find B, we're gonna do this case 22 minus 10 over B minus 11, and that would equal the average rate of change of three halves. So three times B minus 11, that would be three B minus 33. That would equal two times 22 minus 10. Well, 22 minus 10 is 12, and two times 12 is 24. So add the 33 over to the other side. 3b now equals 57, and therefore b must be 19. Okay, and then last but not least, to find c. Again, you don't necessarily have to go back to b or even to a you should be able to go all the way back, even just to this initial point at one negative five and calculate the slope there. And between those two points, the average rate of change still has to be three halves because we define this as a linear function. So if I find the slope to find point C, I would do C minus negative five if I go all the way back to the beginning. If you chose another point, confirm that we got the same answer here. So that becomes C plus five, 45 minus one would go in the denominator there. And that would be equal to three halves. Okay, so if we cross multiply, we're gonna get two times C plus five, so that's two C plus 10. And then we're gonna get three times 45 minus one, so that's three times 44. And three times 44 should be 122 or 132. Forgot my calculator here, guys. 
How about 132 sounds better. Okay, 132. So then if I subtract the 10 over, 2C equals 122. Dividing the 2 out gives you that C is 61 in that last case. All right, so it is very repetitive once you get to get the hang of it and know that we're just setting each example equal to three halves. But it's definitely good practice with knowing that linear functions have that constant average rate of change. And that also, it doesn't matter which pair we choose to find the slope between, that any pair along um, this set of data points should give you the same average rate of change. That's actually it for today's lesson. So when we get to our recap tomorrow, again, I really think it's important that you go back and take a look at page 24 in the packet. Make sure you understand all of this because I'm gonna be asking you questions in class assuming that you've read through it and that you have a good solid understanding unless you have some questions in advance. Again, that's on page 24. All right, that's it for me for today. Have a great day.